Hello everybody, my name is KevGuy378 and welcome back to Depression Quest. The last decision I made in this video was to sit at my desk and just try and do the work even though I might not accomplish it. You may get stop at your fridge, turn your favorite playlist on and sit down to start working. You open the last file you were working on, and as soon as your hands touch the keyboard, your mind goes blank. All the motivation and ideas you had when you arrived home vanish in a flash. Your brain seizes up and you find yourself physically incapable of any sort of productivity thought, productive thought. You take a break to loosen up, popping into your email inbox, Twitter, and various other internet-based distraction fodder. Frustratingly, this pattern continues throughout the course of the evening. As soon as you try and focus on work, your brain diverts all its energy away from the task at hand. While you keep flicking back to your work, you find the sheer mental effort involved in keeping your brain focused is overwhelming and tiring. A few Twitter arguments, YouTube videos, and sparse amounts of actual work later. Your playlist flips back to track one and, your, and the ice in your glass has all but melted, diluting the last dregs of the coke you were nursing. You look at the clock and realize that a few hours have passed since you sat down to work and you've made negligible progress. I can just wake up early tomorrow and catch up, you think to yourself as you climb into bed, even though you know that never actually happens. That's what I thought too, a lot of times. I would do this a lot, because I would feel, when I was at school, I felt, I felt, I compared myself a lot with a lot of my classmates, and I just felt a big disappointment in myself. I, I felt I wasn't as good as them. And then I just didn't get anything done. And then I would just think, oh, I'll just wake up and, you know, do the work. You're very depressed. You spend a large amount of time sleeping, hating yourself, and have very little energy or motivation. No therapist, and no medication. It's a mild Friday afternoon. Alex calls you from one of her classes telling you that there's going to be a really awesome birthday party tonight at her apartment that one of her roommates is throwing. You've hung out with, his, with this roommate a few times with Alex and you get along well enough but aren't particularly close. You don't have work in the morning and have nothing else in particular to do tonight. You're feeling kind of run down. We have been fatigued most of the time lately. You mentioned that you're feeling ill because you're not sure how else to explain those feelings to someone else say that you aren't sure that you can make it tonight. There's a second of silence over your phone where you can swear you can hear the sound of your partner's face fall. She tries to convince you anyway. You haven't seen her this week and she tr sounds pretty insistent that you come over. She even drops a few suggestively worded hints that you can stay over with them tonight after the party. What do you do? Check off the phone and have a good time with your girlfriend. That can't be done. Agree to go, say that you're really just not feeling well and can't make it. I would agree to go and, and try to make the best of it. You agree to go, even though you're really not feeling social. You know it's important to Alex and you'd really like to see her. Seeing her does make you feel better sometimes and you hope that this is the case tonight. Even if, it, even if it does mean dealing with all these usual social anxiety. The time to leave rolls around and you grab your overnight bag. Alex's apartment is a short walk away and there are ready people hanging out on the porch. You feel your chest tighten as you approach the building and try to steal your nerves. You quickly find your partner chatting away with the birthday girl. And Alex immediately lines up when, he's, when she sees you. I'm so happy you came. I wasn't sure if you were going to make it. A young man taps her on the shoulder and she turns back to you to apologize and let you know they had to do something for the party. Alex hands you a beer and plants a kiss on your cheek before going off to deal with whatever came up. As you look around, you don't see anyone else you recognize. Enthusiastically socialize? Nope. 
awkwardly stand in the same spot and unsure what else to do. Put your bag in your, Alex, in your Alex's room and avoid the crowd in there for a while. Cling to the back wall, sip your beer, and wait for your girlfriend to return. Proceed to drink in earnest, hoping it makes you less uncomfortable. What I would do, would do is that I would, I would just cling to the wall and sip the beer and wait for my girlfriend to come back. If I was in this, if I was uh, that situation. As Alex leaves, you're not quite sure what to do with yourself. Standing in the middle of the room leaves you feeling kind of exposed and you don't feel ballsy enough to randomly approach any of the groups of people clustered together talking. You head to a clear spot on the back wall and lean against it. For some reason, this always feels a lot more secure. You scan the party for a familiar face or any sign of your partner and come up with nothing. Not sure what else to do and worrying that you m must look creepy just standing there watching everyone. You take out your phone to busy yourself. 20 semi-tedious games of Bejeweled Blitz later, your partner returns. You spend the rest of the night with Alex, occasionally being introduced to people and nodding along with group conversations, even if you don't participate that much. At the end of the night, as you're falling asleep with your girlfriend in the crook of your arm, she thanks you again for coming. Half drunk, she confides that she thought you were going to flake out and was pleasantly surprised that you managed to come out. She says it lovingly, but you're not quite sure how you feel about that statement. I'm still very depressed, no therapist, and no medication. It's a little after noon on a muggy Saturday. Your mother has come over for a surprise visit, claiming loudly that she doesn't see you enough, so she decides to invite herself over. As you converse, she walks around your place, and you get the distinct impression that you're being inspected. So, what's going on with you lately? She asks abruptly. Taken aback, somewhat aback by this left fielder, you tell her you're not sure what she means. She repeats the question, saying that you haven't seemed like yourself lately. She gestures to the dirty dishes piled in the sink, and notes the fact that you haven't caught or visited in a while. Your reticence only seems to spur her on more. She presses you, asking if you're having problems at work or with Alex. You're beginning to feel increasingly battered by her sudden well-meaning but overwhelming inquisition. Under her questions, you become increasingly uncomfortable. You want to be able to explain to her how you've been feeling, but the truth is you're not really sure how yourself. Nothing horrific has happened at work or with your significant other or friends or anything like that. But all the same, you can't deny that lately, you've just felt drained and as though you're not really here. You wish you could tell your mother these things, but she hasn't been approachable about negative emotions in the past. She is the kind of person who holds the opinion that the solution to any problem is to simply try harder and maintain a positive attitude. A stance that has reared its head in past conversations when you've begun to explore the subject with her. You know she's unlikely to be understanding, and you feel the energy drain out of you when you imagine what would happen if you managed to blurt out everything you are feeling. What do you do? Let her know that you've been feeling down lately and that you, are, you appreciate her concern. Can't do that. Try to be honest with her anyway. Tell her that everything is fine and thank you for asking. Change the subject. Well, if I feel that... If I already feel that I can't really tell my mother anything, then... And I would just really either not do two. I'll tell her that everything is fine and thank her for asking. I'm okay, Mom. Really, thanks for worrying about me. Your mother looks at you from across the room with furrowed brows, and you wonder if the tone in your voice was the least bit convincing. She slightly opens her mouth as though she was about to say something more, but instead she digs through her purse for her cell phone, having apparently decided against it. Well, as long as you're okay, honey, her voice trails. As your mother returns to what amounts to more or less small talk, you realize that this part of the conversation has happened a lot recently. 
Someone will express concern for you or ask if you're okay out of seemingly nowhere. You tend to find it simply just to declare that you're okay, then find the right words for complicated and murky feelings. Besides, since none of them are in reaction to a specific event, maybe you really are okay and just complaining about nothing anyway. Sometimes, when you insist that you're okay to those who ask, you have to wonder if you're trying to convince them or yourself. Usually, you're doing. Usually, you're doing it to convince yourself. You, you you try to really just make it, make yourself believe that you're okay, but in reality you're not, and it, it's it's just it's difficult to to express that you you have been depressed or you're just feeling down and stuff. I'm still very depressed, not seeing a therapist, and no medications. That's a spooky picture. It is a lazy Sunday morning. You are idly clicking around online as your phone rings. Sam, a coworker of yours that you are friendly with, asks how you are, and makes hurried small talk with you. you. Typically, only ever talk to him on his phone when one of you needs a shift covered, so it's slightly awkward. You're waiting in anticipation for him to ask you to come in on short notice when he veers the conversation in a completely different direction. Hey. How do you feel about cats? He asked. Mine had kittens a few weeks ago, and I'm feeling an awfully hard time finding a home for the last one of the litter. You don't have any pets, right? It takes you a moment to process this new information. You're caught off guard as he begins to earnestly try to sell you on the idea of taking the last kitten off his hands. It's not something that you had specifically considered before, and he seems fairly insistent. She's a real sweetheart. Really loves people. She's got all her shots already taken care of, and the vet said she's healthy as a horse. I can bring her over by your place tonight if you're interested. You look around your apartment and try to picture a cat in it as he continues to tell you about how cute she is. You tell him that this is all kind of sudden and that you don't have anything for the kitten set up here. Oh, don't worry about that. I can bring over a litter box and food and all that since you'd really be helping me out of a fix. It's the least I could do. I just don't want to. I have to put her in a shelter. You can't help but feel like you're being guilt tripped, but you decide to give it some serious consideration. It does get awfully lonely around your apartment. It might feel less empty with a cat around. However, since you've been feeling so down, it might not be a good idea to take on the responsibility of a cat, even if you are fairly low maintenance. What do you do? Take the cat, knowing full well that you can take great care of it. Decline, even though you'd be totally capable of taking care of it. You're not much of a cat person. Become a cat person. Cat owner, you could use the companionship. Decline, you're not in a good enough place to be taking on more responsibility right now. Decline, you don't like cats. And what I would do is I would become a cat owner.、Um, I believe that having animals or pets as a companion really puts puts the mood.、Um, it really lifts up the mood sometimes to really have have an animal there that you know cares about you or or something to really just you know hug and just. Talk to sometimes. Just nice to have some someone there, you know. Aw, you accept the offer of a, of the kitten. Hang up shortly after making arrangements for when your coworker can drop her off tonight. You're not entirely sure what to expect, and you spend the rest of the afternoon researching cat care online and trying to think of a name. The evening rolls around, and you hear a knock at your door. Startling you out of reading Wikipedia entirely too hard, you take possession of a small, terrified black and white kitten in a carrier, along with everything you need to start taking care of her. You take her into your bedroom and close the door and open the door to the carrier excitedly. She cowers in the back of it, and you back off, feeling slightly defeated. You remember that you re- researched on introducing a kitten to a new home, and leave her alone to go mess around on your computer. Hopefully, checking over your shoulder every so often to see if she has come out yet. She hides inside her carrier. 
periodically making sorrowful cat howls long enough for you to start worrying that she already doesn't like you. But by the time you go to bed, she's curled up at the foot of it, eyeing you nervously before falling asleep. Over the next few days, you gain her trust and she begins affectionately following you around, sleeping on you, and hopping up on you anytime you sit down to do some work. I am still very depressed, no therapist, and no medication. And this is where I'm going to end the video, everybody. Everyone, thank you for watching. If you guys enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to it, subscribe to me, and just share this video, please. It would help me a lot, and I appreciate it so much. But just share it, just for awareness of what depression can be like for people. So thank you everybody, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Goodbye! Okay,